to another long-awaited episode of Bodies, Barbells, and Bagels. With my co-host Sean McLeany. That's me. And we are here today to talk about a much-requested topic. What are we going to be talking about today, Sean? We're going to be discussing binge eating and mm-hmm. overconsumption. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to kind of break down binge eating and really talk about number one. What is binge eating? What is classed as a binge? Mm. Because I think that's something that people often want to put a label on when really like, number one, there doesn't need to be a label for it, but it is good to kind of define, I guess, your food habits. I think it'd be a better term to use. It's almost like when people say they have a disordered eating versus having um, an eating disorder. Yeah. They are two very different things. So it's really good to understand your relationship with food, which is kind of what we're going to talk about today. So even if you haven't been someone that's maybe struggled with binge eating, this could also just even help you with your food relationship. Um, And that's kind of what we want to get across. I mean, you could say I binge ate last night when I ate an entire uh, family box from KFC. (laughs) So yeah, we've we've had some quality food in our diet lately. Um, But I don't feel bad at all. (laughs) No. (laughs) Maybe bad in the guts because I've been to the toilet five times today. But you are consciously eating that food, which is what we want to talk about a little bit more about conscious and unconscious eating. Um, the variables between psychological and physiological mm. um, response to nutrition and really getting you guys to understand this a little better. Obviously, a bit of a disclaimer, we are not psychologists, but at the same time, the physical, physiological ones are definitely more coach-related yeah. in terms of a nutritionist and someone in the industry with experience. Um, whereas the psychological ones, a lot of the time, we do have to refer out um, when there's things that really go beyond our scope. Yeah. And I think as a coach, if you're a coach listening, that's really important. If you've got somebody who's a chronic, severe binge eater and it's mainly an emotional response, um, you can't be scared to refer out. You can't think that you're going to be able to fix every problem, especially if it's beyond, well beyond your scope. So yeah. If it's deeply rooted in like past and that's yeah. their their catharsis is turning to food but i mean between us we've got 25 years of coaching people so we've worked with a lot of people with disordered eating and yeah whatever you so you know it's, it's our jam as well stuff you will have to deal with if you're a coach yeah, but, but at the just same depends time, what that. And sometimes that person's not in a position where they can be coached. No, exactly. And that's another big thing. Yep. Like, because they stay in be, your lane. Yeah, they thing. could be so food focused that them focusing on tracking macros or following a meal plan is triggering whatever's going yeah. on because they've got a bad relationship with food and they need to have a break from that for a while, sort out, sort out the psychological issues, and then come back to it mm. when they're ready. Um, and that's another really good thing to think about. Like I hear a lot of a lot of people coach hopping and they'll go from coach to coach to coach because yeah. they're binge eating, but then trying to think that the coach is going to have some solution when often it's that they might need to see a psychologist yeah. or do some deeper work before even worrying about their body image or their nutrition. Yep. Um, so yeah, anyway, um, we will we'll jump a- into our him and her tips yeah. this week. And yeah, we just, you know, we're trying our best with the podcast. We have got another episode coming up next week and we're going to aim to be more consistent with it. And we're just doing our best. We've just been hustling, I guess. What we've and you have a to. baby growing in you. So we do. And not I don't we, want to you. use that as an excuse. Yeah. But like at the same time, like, mate, pregnancy has been way harder than mm. what I thought it was ever going to be. It's been a breeze for me. It's been a breeze for sure. Yeah. And he's got to eat whole family KFC boxes. Yeah. And um, You had a nugget. And half a burger. Yeah. I like, had three burgers, five nuggets, large chips, mashed potato, what else? Yeah. All that sort of stuff. It sounds it's disgusting great. to me right mm. about now. So it kind of rolls into the topic of binge eating a little bit with the pregnancy because I was somebody that struggled so hard with binge eating mm. for many years and eating disorders. And since I've been pregnant, I have been the least food focused in my entire life. Yeah. Like I don't even, food doesn't even appeal to me anymore. No. So I can't even cook in the house no. with specific flavors. No. It just, cause you have such food aversions, protein and vegetables really. Yeah. I literally had barely eaten anything all day yesterday, which was why we ended up at KFC. Cause Sean was like, if you can eat anything in the world, what would it be? And I was like, Ugh. Not really that, but like it's always open and... <laughs> we wanted fish and chips, but it seems in Perth that no fish and chip shops open past 8.30. Nah. So I ate half a burger and like one nugget and that was pretty much it and I was done for the day. So yeah, really just the picture of health at mm. the moment. But that's why it has been a little more challenging. Um, mm. And also the fatigue has been the other big thing. So it's been comp season too. So it's just been really hectic. So I'm hoping once comp season starts to wind down that we'll be able to be more consistent. Mm. If you guys also want to hear, I don't want to rant about the pregnancy on this podcast, but if you want to hear more about 
I guess, further along because we did that conception fertility one. If you want to hear more like first trimester, yeah. second trimester, um, any questions, please let us know. Flick us an email because I know there's a lot of girls on my social media that are pregnant at the moment going through it with me. Um, again, we're not experts, but we do, again, have a lot of experience with pregnant women. Even though this is our first pregnancy, mm. we've been through it a lot with clients. Yeah. Um, so we're going to get into our For Him and Her tip this week. So you want to start off with your For Him tip? Sure. My thing, uh, very simple and uh, easy one, is a lot of people, I expect more so guys, but girls as well, if you're trying to bulk up the calories and struggling to get them down, one thing that I have found recently, and I was experimenting with when I saw Thor Bjornsson and also Brian Shaw doing it, is trying to get down mountains of rice because I love rice, and personally I find it moderately easy to eat a couple of kilos of rice per day, um, (laughs) because I like food. Um, But adding chicken stock to that rice once it's in the bowl is actually so easy to eat. It kind of turns it into a semi-soup, and then you kind of just... Yeah, yeah, ish, yeah, and it's not even a lot of chicken stock. It's just, all I do is I chop a, a chicken stock cube into four little bits, uh, put about 150 mils of water with it, smash that over the top of my rice and my beef and my veggies and whatever you, and then you're kind of half drinking it, eating it. And it digests really easy as well because there's a little bit of fluid in there. But very nice. So, you don't think of anything more disgusting right now. <laughs> rice and stock. It's you delicious. It the other day and yeah, I, like, I made you some. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it's it's very easy to eat, and it's a lot easier to get. Like I can I can put five hundred to eight hundred grams in a bowl, one hundred fifty grams of stock, and it goes down really easily. Mm. So lovely jobly. So calories in, easy yeah. peasy. So when you're trying to yeah reverse diet, a lot of our girls trying to build their metabolisms, yeah. um, simple food tips like that. Yep. Awesome, easy one. Perfect, me so lady. Mine is about periods. Because, oh nice. Um, well, you know what the one great thing about pregnancy mm. is? No fucking period. Yeah. <laughs> that's fist bump. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's probably the one um, really big positive. Um, but so the thing I want to talk about periods is more weight fluctuation. I have a lot of my girls who check in on a weekly basis and their weight fluctuates usually at two times of the month. Generally when they're around their ovulation point and generally premenstrual. And this is something that you need to be aware of. Because if you are using weight as the only variable to justify fat loss, then you're going to have a bad time as a female because over the course of a month, your weight is going to fluctuate a lot. Now, you've got to remember that weight loss is different to fat loss and that we want to be focusing in on fat loss. And that's why I get my clients to do girth measurements, to do photos, to also (laughs) focus in on where they're at in their cycle when they do their check-ins and to be mindful of those things. Because a lot of the time, I'll get a check-in from a client and they'll go, I trained so hard this week, I smashed it, I nailed yeah. my macros, and my weight hasn't dropped, and they're in a fatless phase. And they get so upset, and then when I have to email them back and say, look, let's be realistic, the fact that you didn't drop probably means you did drop, because you're probably holding yeah. more fluid if you're premenstrual. So I bet next week you'll probably be down a kilo rather than, say, 500 mm. grams if you're consistent with that. But that's when a lot of people give up, binge eat, which again rolls into our podcast, results, psychological. So don't focus on just the scales at one point in the week. The other thing you got to think about is not just premenstrual, but you're going to have weight changes from sodium, fluid retention. Uh, We had a meal... I went to a baby shower on Sunday mm. and I had also been on my feet all day um, at a photo shoot and just eaten really pretty shit food all day. Um, and then I got on the scales the next day and I'd had a lot of salt and drank a lot of water before bed because I was pretty dehydrated. And I was a kilo up in one day. Yeah. Now that doesn't mean I've gained a kilo, kilo of fat. fat in one day. Yeah. And then I weighed again yesterday and then gone back down a kilo. Yeah. So it just goes to show that the scales, if you focus your happiness around them, especially around that time of the month, that can be a bit of a nightmare. So the best thing that I say to do is still weigh yourself, you know, every week or a couple of times a week, if your mindset is okay with the scales. If not, just don't use them. But then look at the average over the course of a month. Is it trending down over that course of a month? If it's having a bit of fluctuation, that's okay. But is the average is lower than, say, the two or three or four weeks before? Mm. Um, even look at what the average was when you were the same time in your period the month before. That's what I was going to say. Um, so all of those things, just basically just don't be too scale focused. I yeah. think predicting it as well. Like if, yeah, you, coming up. if yeah. you're doing this month after month after month, you're like, okay, my weight's gone up. I know that. Yeah. I'm coming up to my period. So yeah. just Think come to it. terms just with logically. it. Logically, yeah. yeah. It's that whole, like, just be rational. Yeah. And sometimes with um, 
progress, people are highly irrational mm. because you get stuck in your own head. But if this was a friend saying it to you and they come up to you and started crying and go, oh my God, I've put on two kilos. Mm. And they said, but I don't know, I'm about to get my period. You would logically go, yeah. well, a lot of that's probably fluid attention. Yeah. A lot of that's this and that. Um, so all of those things are really, really important to think about. And same with, around ovulation. It's often not as much fluid retention around ovulation, um, but often digestive issues. So mm. pay attention to that. And then if you're having digestive issues, that can cause, again, fluid retention, more just food in the digestive tract that's going to be sitting there, food volume, from that surging progesterone that's going on. And that was something I didn't really pay attention to until um, probably we started trying to get pregnant. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, I didn't realize I was more bloated around that sort of 14, 12 to 14 day That mark. damn progesterone. Exactly. Constipation around. Mm, the other joys of pregnancy. Mm. Yeah. yeah, haven't had the hemorrhoids yet. So no. <laughs> fingers, fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. Lovely. Lovely. <laughs> All right. So that is my fur tip this week. So we're going to get Very into nice. it now. If you want to kick it off, Sean. Well, I think what we should start with is what is the difference between a binge and just general overconsumption? Yeah. So, you know, like a binge in my eyes is when it's just uncontrollable eating. Mm-hmm. Like, for there may be triggers, but you've just gone completely to town. You've had no three way. blocks of chocolates. You've had a whole tub of ice cream. You've just gone uncontrollably crazy and over the top. And you're basically lying in bed an hour later. You don't really realize what you've done. Yeah. The way that I describe it is a loss of control. Yeah. Is an easy way to think about Because even if you're saying that, people go, okay, well, I only had one pack of Tim Pams. You said on a binge is three. It's like, no, there's not a number yeah, that no. you put on a binge. It's when it's it's out of control and yeah, you can't stop yourself. And you're in that mood of going, I just want more. And mm. I need more. And I'm full, but I'm keeping going. Yeah. Like you're, you're past the point of even hungry. You like, just wouldn't even like think of eating that normally as well. No, you know? no. And I've had clients before that have binged on, say their calorie goals are 2,000, consuming 5,000 calories. Like that, that is a solid binge. Like, that's yeah. a good effort. Yeah. So like, you know, I would say a couple of hundred calories, not a binge. No. Like, and I think that's the semantics and of... How pedantic you want to be about when people say, oh, I had a binge on the weekend. And it's exactly that. And I'll say to some of my clients sometimes when they say that, I'm like, did you actually like put into my fitness pal what you ate? And I've had them two or three hundred calories tops. And they beat themselves up And it's like, that's not a binge. That's a minor mistake. Yeah. And look, there doesn't need to be a label on it at the end of the day. But for a client reporting to a coach, if you check in with your coach and go, oh my God, coach, I binged on the weekend. We're going to think worst case scenario. Yeah. So you almost need to tell them exactly what you have done if you're working with a coach yeah. and go, look, I you know, got home from work and I was starving and I had two extra slices of toast and some <laughs> peanut butter. And it's like, yeah, not a great option. Like you've gotten pretty much carbs and fats and we probably mm. should have got some protein in. But really that's only about 300 calories, yeah. maybe a little bit more, maybe 400, depending on how yolo you were with the peanut butter. But <laughs> if you then sat there with a tub of peanut butter and continued to eat the whole thing, that's, then that's a binge. That's a binge, exactly, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly, because again, you're consciously knowing that you're self-sabotaging at that yeah. point. Whereas a couple of slices of toast because you're starving, that's not as much self-sabotage as what um, no. just sitting down and just going, fuck it, I'm not even tracking this. That's just I'm going just... over your macros, Yeah, pretty yeah, much. exactly. As opposed to eating a week's worth of fat. <laughs> yeah, and I probably get that more with prep clients where they say they've had a binge and then you ask them what it was and it was like an extra piece of chicken yeah. roast and you're like, no, okay, yeah, we do need to figure out you know solutions because you can't go off the plan in prep, but it's it, don't label that as a binge. Mm. Um, a binge would be a post-show binge when you have yeah. <laughs> like gone to You hear like, some you know, like, epic I've had some post-show. Have you? Yeah, I never have. So. Oh, yeah. I, uh, I, the worst big binge I ever had was I went to a basically a chocolate cafe Okay. Um, the night after a Not show. Not my jam. Yeah, but, and yeah. it was like I had a chocolate dessert pizza, a fondue. Um, I'd also had a burger before this. And then I had um, donuts, like everything literally there. But then that wasn't even really binge eating because I didn't, I remember I didn't finish all of it and I was with other people. So it was quite a social experience. And the other thing to think about is you don't often binge eat in social settings no. that heavily. You might overeat again, yeah. but you don't tend to binge. But then I got home and proceeded to eat more chocolate and more ice cream and then spewed mm. all night. So Would you that's... say a, a binge is a, a very solo 
Absolutely. Lonely thing yeah, a, as well. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Um, oh, sometimes I'll have clients where they'll binge with their partner. Yeah, maybe that's at true. Home, yeah. Um, and they'll just, but again, they're consciously making that decision together to go, fuck it, let's go to town yeah. tonight. Let's get a pizza and we'll have ice cream. And again, it's not so much of an emotional response. It's like a choice that you've made. That's like, exactly it. Yeah, yeah. So it's, again, that's where we want to differentiate the why behind binge eating. That's more like boredom eating and yeah. just like a decision to overeat. Whereas a uncontrollable psychological binge, where that's an emotional response. Mm. Um, and that's the thing we really want to get you determining. And then there's also the binges that are triggered from the physiological. So yeah. that's also what we want to touch on. I think we should go to that now, yeah. really. So yeah. do you want to do um, emotional responses to... Yeah, I think the physiological ones are probably easier to start with. But yeah. I guess what we should probably clarify is, I guess, our relationship with food. True, um, yeah. So in terms of like us, we've probably got different... We I think have very... Different, I guess we have different backgrounds, but yeah. we still have a similar approach and perspective Absolutely, on solutions. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So even though Sean personally hasn't struggled with this that no. much, or if at all, in his life, <laughs> he's still a very good coach for helping people with it. So just because you yeah. haven't experience something as a coach doesn't mean you can't help someone with something. It'd be like Sean not being able to help girls with their periods because yeah. he doesn't get a cycle. Like, of course no. he knows how to talk to someone <laughs> when they've got yeah. a period. Um, the same with me telling a guy how to do a chest fly. He's got erection how to train. problems. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's got a low libido. Yeah, you know? post-show. Like, again, I know how to talk about that. But yeah. It doesn't mean that I've ever had a like struggle getting an erection. No. Like, so You're straight up. I <laughs> yeah, I'm erect. No, so, I, I, yeah, I think, yeah, we are very different. Like Me, personally, I, I was an underfed skinny kid. Until yeah. I was 24. So as soon as I actually found food and started earning money and enough money to actually feed myself and started training, because I didn't start actual weight training until I was 24 or 25, um, I needed the calories to grow. So mine, like, I, my binge would just be the consumption that I need. So I'm super, so I'm, I'm very lucky. But if you saw what I eat in a day, especially when I was growing, uh, it would look like a binge mm. because I remember when I was on the ships, I would eat 10,000 calories a day. It was conscious calories. Consciously inside. eating 10,000 calories. That's the thing. You so you would see, I remember my fitness partner at the time, because there was two of us trainers in, in the um, gym, we would get three or four main courses each per dinner. So it's three or four. So I'd have three or four. He'd have three or four. Plus we'd go and get someone from the buffet later on at night. So mm. there's easily 6,000 calories there in like one, one or two meals. So for me, it was just like, I need those calories. Yeah, even even now, go, oh, my God, look at those oh it's disgusting, binging. Yeah. binging away and blah, blah, blah. But another thing was it was decent food. So yeah. it was always the protein there and, and the carbs and the fats. I mean, there's still pizza and what have you but yeah um so very different like i personally haven't struggled from i don't even know like yes i ate a whole 30 dollar kfc family box the other day and i quite frequently do that but i personally need those calories and you don't do it because you go oh i'm craving kfc no. you go i need calories i'm, my, I'm just not recovering open. let's yeah. go get that yeah yeah i'm just not recovering at the moment i need like a massive whack of calories so for me it's i can very consciously decide what I need in my body. And also, I don't know, in terms of like post comp, you know, yes. you, I've never, yeah, you say you get annoyed at me because. Oh my God, when I was coaching him last year and he was reverse dieting out of his show, it was just like. I just crave fruit and yogurt when I got off stage and just more food. Yeah, you just pretty much ate the same stuff you were eating. Just more, just more, yeah. And I'd be like, we didn't even really go out for a post show meal because I think we had something on at that time. I think I was dieting. Uh, we went to Nando's and then we had to come back for the night show, on yeah. Stage then and everything was shut. Then I had to deal with, I think, six girls reverse dieting and yeah. dealing with them in food, and Sean was totally fine. So. Yeah, and that's just but I think a the, difference the, the, of. The amazing thing from what I guess I see, sorry, cut you off yeah. there about your mindset with food is that um, you have such a good relationship with food, but you see food as fuel for your body yeah. and you have goals and a focus. So your goal is either that you're trying to get stronger and trying to aid recovery, so you generally eat more. You're either trying to lose fat, so you're going to be in a deficit, so you're mm. eating better quality food, more volume, you don't eat KFC boxes no. when you're doing Hell that. Hell no, no. Or you're trying to just kind of maintain and live when you'll be kind of more relaxed with your tracking for periods yeah. of time, because you're not super strict with it year-round. No. Um, you know, so I think that that's a cool place to be in and a good mindset to have. Is yeah. That almost you have like a bit of an athlete mindset. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, that's exactly it. Um, and I think it's... 
it comes back to when I have the calories to play with, then I can use the 80-20 rule of 80% good nourishing food, 20% funsies, yeah. which is going to keep me compliant. Yeah. So, and that's, I think that's a huge thing is what is your blueprint to compliancy yeah and it's gonna be that, very different than mine and a lot of girls say to me oh well how hard is it living with sean because he's got such a good metabolism he gets to eat you know six thousand calories a day and eat all the shit food and blah 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 <laughs> and like some women listening might be thinking that going oh it's easy for him he's got yeah. all these calories to play with so he can eat that but really you don't eat that you put on instagram no. usually your crappiest food mm. and don't put up a lot of the time the actual normal meals that you pretty much consume no and that. i don't put up me doing twenty five thousand steps a day and a and training a lot and being a pt yeah. exactly and that's the thing is another thing is i know that if i am gonna over eat not binge i will then put in the effort to put it to use yeah. or burn the calories as much as I can you know I'm not just going to go fuck I've eaten the KFC I'm going to go and do four hours of cardio yeah. I think well I'll just do something yeah. to kind of make up for it and I think the other good thing about your relationship with food is that well you, you did used to be a chef so you're very yeah. creative so mm. the other thing that food has to people, be tasty yeah and people will probably be thinking though listening to this oh, well Sean sounds like a robot he <laughs> just eats because he's got to get calories yeah. in and fuel and he probably doesn't care about the taste of food it's the total opposite. Oh, no. yeah. You're more into the taste of food than me. Mm. I probably eat more bro than you when I'm actually dieting down and doing those sort of things. Yeah. But you are creative with your meals and that's important. So if you've got less calories, then you're just a little more playful with like what you can do with your foods. Yeah. And, but you still eat nice food. Like, you know, you're making yeah. ramen bowls on prep and like different things like that and kind of just having to put a little more effort in and thought in. And I think that's delving into your side a little bit of the psychological compliancy to it is yeah. if the calories are coming down, like for me personally, I don't want to eat just dry, shitty chicken breast. Yeah. I want to get a little bit creative so my compliancy can be better because I'm still enjoying my food. Yeah. So it's like, for example, yeah, you said I used to do ramen bowls. So I'd bulk up the volume of food via stock. stock. Um, I would do like a leaner version of a chicken parmigiana. Mm. So I just literally chicken breast, some lean ham, some tomato passata sauce, and that low-fat mozzarella cheese. Yeah. So psychologically, that's great for compliancy. Yeah. And then I'm still eating similar foods to what tastes really nice and what you would eat in a restaurant, mm. which stops me thinking, fuck, I just want to eat the massive deep-fried parmigiana. Which is where flexible dieting kills meal plans. A hundred like, million percent, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, If you're somebody that struggles with binge eating, any of my clients that struggle with binge eating, I would never put in a meal plan. No. So be like, you need flexibility Especially if you're over consuming on foods that aren't in your meal plan. Like, yeah. nobody over consumes on chicken breasts. Oh, yeah. ever, like, Unless it's dry, Nando's. Yeah, like dry chicken yeah. breasts. And like, even then, it's very how easy often to do fix. You, on egg whites? Go, like, you know what I mean? Like, I've literally never heard that. I just had like four cartons of egg whites. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'll quite happily eat two whole Nando's chickens. Yeah, I get more with my male clients used to eat more like extra yeah. steak or protein. Yeah. Food. With my females, it's egg definitely whites. I over on carbs, I over on chocolate, chocolate <laughs> yeah. I over on. You know, yeah, sweet potato or things like that. So, um, I yeah, I think we've talked about how much of a perfect angel Sean is with his food now. <laughs> Yours is very different. They're very so different. So, I just want to give you guys a bit of reality that, you know, not you might have people in the population, probably people I coach, it's probably a, I would say, 60-40 split. I probably have 60% that are in a really good place with food and probably about 40% that have some form of, I wouldn't say again, disordered eating, but maybe bad habits yeah. and mindsets with their relationship with food. Um, so it's very common, like very common. It's, and not, gu it. it's not guys and girls. No, are, I think like guys really struggle. Exactly, post yeah. Show. Everyone yeah. thinks it's just girls, but hell no. I don't think guys talk about and it. And that's, ex that's they, exactly it. Yeah, I think guys are more embarrassed yeah. by binge eating because they think of it as an emotional, like, Bit of a pussy move, yeah, you know exactly. What I mean? Yeah, like, oh, I had I a hard week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but working with guys, it's just, I wouldn't say quite as common, yeah, but it is very common. And I think it's a lot of guys that have had big weight loss journeys all of the yeah. time that I've worked with, um, and that have a few body image issues often from that. And that can be similar with girls as well. So, yeah. again, it's not male to female. I think females blame it on their hormones a lot which i think is a little yeah. bit of bs and that again we will talk about in the psychological hmm. a little more in the physiological um but my relationship with food again without going too into depth on it 
Um, but if you want to hear more about that, I talked about it a lot on my podcast that I did with Perth Fit Fam. Um, so I would go back and listen to that mm. because they go into the more the psychological reasons why I struggled in depth. Um, but really, I want to talk more about my relationship with food today and where it's kind of been the last few years. So... Yeah, I struggled with binge eating that then um, actually rolled into full-on bulimia, which is, again, different, and people need to understand that. Yeah. Binge eating doesn't equal bulimia, and actual eating disorder technically is bulimia or anorexia, um, you know, versions of anemia and things like that as well, like, I'm sorry, anamenorrhea, so the female triad, like, overtraining, that sort of thing too. So I was probably a combination of that, loss of period, bulimia, overtraining, Big combination, um, but then I would, yeah, I would restrict and then have, that was my main trigger, severe restriction, lack of education around food, rolling into severe restriction and then binge, binge purge cycles um, of basically just crap food. And then I managed to sort of overcome that over the years. And then when I competed, I again struggled with it a little bit post-show, definitely the first few years competing. Um, and again, a lot of that was psychological. Mm. A lot of that was lack of goals. Um, I didn't know who I was once the comp was done. I thought that people only liked me because I was stage lean. And then I would then self-sabotage with food. So a lot of it was 90% of that psychological. Um, not a hell of a lot of that was really a physiological response. I wasn't often hungry. I was just doing it because, again, you got to think back to all those reasons why. Yeah. Um, whereas when I competed last year, no, I wasn't as lean as what I've been before. Um, but I didn't binge eat post show. I had a really good relationship no, you were with good, food. Yeah. I reversed out really well for yep. at least the first six weeks. And then we just had life stuff that kind of happened. But again, I didn't binge. It's just, I was training less and my weight just started to go up a little bit. Yeah. Um, and were you actually, yeah, you're actually consciously trying to eat more. Yeah. Tried to eat more yeah. to put on some weight. But too. I never binged once. Like no. I never had a I don't think you've binged since we been together like uh probably haven't probably haven't told you yeah maybe yeah <laughs> <laughs> i would say when we probably first started dating i still probably would do things sporadically but very rarely maybe yeah. like once a year or something like that yeah. like very and that for me is a huge win compared to doing it you know three or four or five times a week you know so mm. that's what i always think is important if you're listening to this if you're somebody who has binge ate for more physiological or psychological reasons and you've gone from doing it daily to doing it once a week to then doing it once a month to then doing it once every six months to then once a year. Celebrate that. Like, don't be hard on yourself because they're probably still not for life, but they're probably still going to be little demons there that you're facing a little bit with food. And I still even have my moments where sometimes I feel really, really full and fullness is a feeling that used to really trigger me. So mm. I would eat so much to the point of fullness and then want to purge. Yeah. So again, today when I have like an IBS flare up and I overeat a little bit. There's those little demons there sometimes that are telling me like, Hey, you could just spew this up. Get out. You, you know yeah. what I mean? But I don't listen to them and then have to rationalize with myself and say, well, that's not going to fix the digestive mm. issues. That's going to make it worse, which I do believe that my issues with bulimia and binge eating caused a lot of my digestive issues that I've had in my whole life. And I didn't have those problems before I started yeah, doing that. It wouldn't have so, helped. Not at all. You think about all the acid reflux, yeah. Just the distension and bloating, the stress on your intestines, like all of those things. Mm. So there is negative impacts to binge eating, just n not just the how you feel, but what's going on in your body because it's a lot of stress. Yeah. So imagine a 50 kilo female and I binge quickly on two, 3,000 calories in one meal. Yeah. That's a lot of stress internally. Especially so, if it's high fat as well. Your poor little gallbladder. Yeah, exactly. Or your pancreas from too much sugar. Yeah, just my, like, bang. my binges used to be like, um, and I used to hide them in my room because I was living at home with my parents. So it was like, you know, started when I was like 16, 17. It would be like a whole tub of connoisseur cookies and cream ice cream. Nice. So whenever I eat that now... I'm more about the eating. macadamia honey <laughs> one. Yeah, yeah. that one. <laughs> but even there's certain foods now that I'm like, this used to be a binge yeah. food. Like, um, and then I get a tub of whipped cream, uh, whipped, can of whipped cream, put that on it. Hmm. And then I'd also put in extra Oreos or Tim Tams, eat a whole packet of that. Yeah. And then I'd usually have a whole packet of like candy or lollies or like snakes or something So would you like eat that. the whole thing? Pretty much, or, yeah. And, that, and that's the thing is that's quite obviously not overconsumption. <laughs> no, no. That's binge. <laughs> yeah, and I would buy it and go, the other thing that a lot of people that binge eat do is go, well, I need to remove this from the house. So you'd have to finish it. 
Yeah. Or you would throw it in the bin and I'd mm. go to the point of pouring detergent on things yeah. so that I wouldn't eat them or I'd spray them with deodorant oh, wow. <laughs> so that I wouldn't then go and pull them out of the rubbish bin. Yeah. And if anybody's seen that Sex and the City episode, I'm sure the girls have, you have to tag me on Instagram where Miranda goes and pulls the chocolate cake out of the bin oh, and she's like, this is a new loaf. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing because she was um, replacing sex with food and she oh. was like trying to hold off having sex with this dude so she was baking chocolate cakes ah. and like eating them um betty crocker fudge you know moist cake and mm. uh she was just should have got her moist from somewhere else nice <laughs> moist for moist <laughs> yeah. so yeah it does get to that point where you in your head it sounds batshit crazy thinking back to it and some of the stuff i don't like to admit that i've done but i know it makes women feel more comfortable about stuff yeah. that maybe they're going you've through. grown from it from actually talking out loud about it. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people are ashamed of that. I mean, I was a coach when I was doing like a lot of this as well, not so much when I was younger, but it did continue on and off for at least probably four or five years. Um, so, yeah, I think it's important to talk about it and the lengths that you go to to also hide and cover it up. So that's another big one. Um, but I would say mine was a combination of physiological and psychological. Yeah. I wasn't educated on food, so that was a big one. So that was more physiological. I was trying to find quick fixes. So I would try to go, well, I've had a binge. So I'm going to go super low calories all yep. week because that'll fix it when that's the worst thing that you can do because it's obviously unachievable and then that triggers another binge. Yeah. Um, and then obviously a lot of unhappiness. I, I was so image focused, focused on how I looked all the time. I didn't really love myself internally. So there was a lot of stuff going on there. Um, to where we're at today, I well, pregnant, very different. <laughs> um, you've got a whole different appreciation for your body and food. But even before I got pregnant, um, yeah, food, I again, I've kind of shifted in that mindset of Sean where, yeah, I like food. I really enjoy food, especially sweets. They've always been a trigger for me is more the sweet items. I've never I've really been a binge eater on pizza or McDonald's or any of that. That was never really my go-to with binge eating. I would never really go to a drive through or anything like yeah. that. I used to go to McDonald's and I'd buy like McFlurries. Like I would oh, yeah. go binge on a couple of those and, you know, wouldn't be on other stuff. Um, Again, that's the difference between you and I. Yeah. And I'm also, a savory, you're a sweet. When you're, when you're bulimic, you learn what foods you are easy yeah. to vomit up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, liquid foods and foods that digest faster are going to be easy to get back mm. out. We're not going to delve into those, just no, in I'm case. I'm going to give you tips on <laughs> how to be a good bulimic. <laughs> um, but yeah, so... Yeah, it's, that's kind of where it's at today. Um, a lot of work mentally, but I think a big one is just like loving yourself. Absolutely. And I know that sounds really like generic and like cheesy, but I think true. that it's true. I had to move away from being so image focused for a while as mm. well and stopping trying to lose weight and trying to um, constantly attain for a certain physique. That was probably a big one as well because I wasn't then understanding that if I wanted to say, for example, build muscle and lose fat, that I couldn't keep spinning my wheels and trying to do the two at the same time. So I had to have a period of conscious overeating um, in terms of not being in a deficit to then improve the next time I went to a fat loss phase. Because so, my metabolism was in the toilet from this behavior. So that's yeah. the other thing. I started to think about the health effects. I started to think about fertility. I didn't have a period, like all of that stuff that you start to give the bigger picture of what's important in the scheme of life mm. rather than being like, Really, like, I'm binge eating on food? Like, is this my biggest problem <laughs> that I'm facing? I know yeah. it sounds harsh, but it is giving yourself a reality check. If there's people out there dying, starving in Africa, and I'm binging and being a pig and, yeah. like, have got issues with food, when I'm really living a very, um, very privileged life, mm. like, at the end of the day. And I think when you're 16, 18 at my age going through it, you don't think like that. You don't of think... Not. Fuck, I'm a privileged white chick living in Australia, yeah. like with a roof over my head and people that love me. And I'm sitting here crying in my room about my body image and being so selfish and self-focused and refusing help and not talking to anyone. And But that's the other thing is you, you kind of get into this mindset of going, well, I am being a bit of a brat. So you don't want to tell people. And that was my thing. Nobody knew about it because mm. I felt like it was quite selfish behavior like people wouldn't understand that's yeah. probably a big one you go well someone like you sean i would think back then would judge me and be like well, what's wrong with you i don't yeah. get it like you know back I mean? then i wouldn't know yeah no and if you're an 18 year old boy that i was yeah. dating you'd probably be what like doing? Yeah. what are you doing yeah. yeah exactly so there's all those things to think about but i think it's just about 
it takes a little while to get perspective on where you're at in your life and yeah just priority shift too would you say yours was pro- predominantly psychological or physiological i would say more psychological mm. for sure yeah and just that trying to restrict so much yeah which is more physiological i think um, that could be a difference between males and females is I find a lot of guys I work with, it's physiological. Absolutely. Because they don't... How many guys don't eat enough? Yeah, yeah. You know, as opposed to women, it's a lot more physiological. I agree. You have a lot more stress on you in in life just to kind of look better. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Whereas guys, not so much. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a big part of it. So I guess let's get into breaking down the difference between those and then we'll give you guys some actual active tips on that. So going into more the physiological first, what do you feel like are kind of some of the physiological triggers to start off with? I think one of the biggest things is under eating yeah. is, is really simple. Mm-hmm. If you really think about it, um, this is why reverse dieting is very, it works very, very well. Yes, you have to go for a period of where you may gain weight for a while, but that's purely because you're eating more food. Eventually, the benefits of a faster metabolism from eating more and, and your body just upgrading everything is going to work very well for you. The reason why you have to under eat is because everything's kind of shut down. So, yeah. and your body will get used to eating less calories. So, I think under eating, and again, like I said, especially guys, but also girls as well, is a huge one. So, you get to the point where you under eat for so long that you're just starving. So, you'll get that one day where everything just kicks up a notch, your body's on fire, and you just think, fuck, I need to just give in to this and just binge and eat whatever the fuck I feel I need, you know? Mm. Um, and so I think under eating is, is a big one. And I think going too hard, too fast yeah. in a caloric deficit. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you think about, there's lots of studies. I remember Helms, Eric Helms was talking about one that he showed us in a seminar we went to. He said there wasn't much difference between someone that cut like 150 calories and a thousand calories. Yeah. Um, don't quote me on those numbers, but there wasn't a big difference in terms of actual results. Yes, you're going to drop more weight because you've dropped out a thousand calories of food weight as opposed to 150 calories of food weight. But in terms of fat loss, I think it was very, very similar. But you drop a thousand calories out from someone who's eating 4,000 calories to 3,000 calories, that's 25% of their food gone. 2,000 to (laughs) 1,000, you're not going to stick to that. So compliancy is, is going to be terrible. So you've yeah. gone too hard, too fast. You're going to, and you'll go, you'll just go to fuck it mode. Yeah. You know. So I think that's a really bad trigger. So patience is huge. Yeah. And really. People hate hearing that. Yeah, <laughs> it's awful. Yeah, you but know, it's, it's almost yeah. as bad as the it depends answer. Yeah, it's like when people sign up with you for ten weeks of coaching and go. I want to lose five kilos in 10 weeks and then I'll be done and then I'm good and then see you later. And then what? And then what? And it's like, we're not here to take your money, but at the same time, do you honestly think you're going to achieve all your goals with working with a coach in 10 weeks? Yeah. Like everything that you want to achieve. And also then they'll say things like, oh, but I want to do it in a slow, healthy way and I want to keep my metabolism (laughs) in a good place. It's like... Well, then how and build muscle. Up? Yeah, and build muscle. And also, I want to go out and have a few drinks every weekend. Yeah. And it's like, well, let's be realistic here. Is that possible? Yeah. No, your expectations are completely off the deep end. So you've got to set your expectations accordingly yeah. to the effort that you're putting in. And then also be expectations on yourself of, are you going to be able to stick to that? Yeah. Like, is that realistic for you? I think that's the another one is perfect. being a perfectionist isn't always best. Yeah. So I think when it comes to like coming back to the 80-20 or 90-10 rule, whatever, everyone's blueprint is very different. So mine, when I'm comp prepping, I can do 100% of nourishing food. I don't need any, (laughs) I don't need any foods that will kind of get rid of cravings pure because I'm just that lucky person. I remember comp prep last time. You were having two spoons of dairy, dairy milk chocolate yeah. a day. And then some days, because I would eat it too, I'd be like, you haven't had your dairy milk today. Yeah. And you're like, oh, I forgot. I just won't bother. And yeah, I, I just like, don't need it. Yeah. And I was but like, for me, it's that's, I'd, yeah, I'd, I'll give my, uh, let's say 99%, 1%. Yeah. He's the one person who got a punch yeah. his comp prepping. Yeah. So I, those two squares. A block of chocolate in the fridge for like three weeks. <laughs> and you're like. In the cupboard, thank you. I don't put my I'd chocolate put my fridge in the fridge. I don't put my reading in yeah. the fridge. Yeah. But um, yeah, that those two squares of chocolate for me every day stop me from going. I'm going to eat a whole block of chocolate. Yeah, 
you know. So and that does nothing to. And then for some clients, you can't even have it in the house. And, and that's the di- and that's the difference, that's yeah. And out. that's why I say everyone's blueprint is very different, but. Mm-hmm. You do need, most people need some form of respite in yeah. your calories. So it's the 90, exactly yeah. the 90-10 rule, 90% nourishing, 10%. And that can be dimmer switches. If you're in a, an off season or a growing phase or a, yeah. yeah, you can go to 70%, 80%, whatever's going to keep you compliant without being overly obsessive yeah, cause if you and a perfectionist. Push, if you then also in the other swing of that are in a deficit, and you're eating too many shit foods, yeah, and you're like that's 70%, one, yeah. 30%, yeah, then you're going to be hungry. And that's day. another one, yeah. yeah, exactly. So if you're thinking about one of the key things, either in a dieting phase or not, is food volume. Yeah. So obviously, when your calories go lower, your food volume is going to come down. So you need to be smart about it and actually somehow try and make it come back up by lower calorically dense food. So you want to think about, you know, changing from rice to pumpkin when you're dieting and the reverse when you're going up. But even when you're on 4,000 calories a day, that can be... Can you stop saying that number? Because I feel like a lot of the females listening to this podcast are never going to get to consume 4,000 calories. I've had had some at three and a half, but all right, (laughs) female-wise, let's say two and a half thousand. (laughs) Two and a half thousand is that's a decent whack of food. Yeah. That um, is a pizza. Yeah. You know, so if you pizza, can have so you can have a pizza in that's the day, it. and I can guarantee you'll still be hungry late in the day. Think about block of chocolate. Yeah. Block of chocolate is not that filling. No. Nah. And it's like a thousand calories or something. Tub of Ben and Jerry's eleven hundred calories. Yeah. 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 Um, they're not satiating foods. They're yeah. low in fiber. They're easy to digest. Not much protein in them. So. The thing is satiating foods and food volume. So you've got to hit your protein, you've got to hit your fiber, because they're the two ones that are going to stabilize blood sugar levels and cause satiety in your actual mindset and digestive system. So, you know, calories in, calories out is a very tricky one to say. So yes, it does come down to fat loss and fat gain does come down to calories in, calories out, but it's also another thing where it's like satiety and protein is very satiating. I think it's calories in, calories out, but how do you make that be compliant and how do you assure that you can stick to that? Because again, if you just go, oh, it's so calories in, calories out, yeah. I'm going to eat a thousand calories and like it be from, I don't know, rice cakes. Like, do you think that you're going to really be full by the end of the day on that? No. And then also, are you going to be potentially losing muscle mass when you're doing that too? And then be more hungry because yeah. you're not focusing on the actual macro breakdown or you're not consuming any protein until eight o'clock at night, which I hear very commonly when I listen to food diaries. Yeah. For people that binge eat and overeat because their breakfast is pretty much a typical thing that I'll say with a binge eater. Sorry, I can't get you now. Sure. But they'll go, breakfast, some oats or muesli with some fruit. So literally maybe five grams of protein. Yeah. Then they'll go, morning tea, um, a couple of biscuits and a piece of fruit. No protein. Mm. Lunch, a sandwich, which has like, I don't know, 50 grams of ham in it or yeah. something. And then they'll go, afternoon, binge on a chocolate bo- block of chocolate. Dinner, meat and vegetables. Yeah. And you're like, no wonder you're fucking starving. Yeah. Like, but they think that's a lot of food. Because yeah. it sounds like I've had five meals a day. Shit meals. I mean, a lot of it. But yeah. there's no satiety no to balance, it. No balance, yeah. no structure. No. Yeah, no... And then they've also maybe gone to the gym in the morning. And yeah. It's like, like, or the evening, and then they don't have carbs at night. And they're mm. like, I'm just going to have meat and veg. And yeah. like, so all your nutrient time is off, all of your balance of food. So, of course, you're going to be starving. Yeah. Like, imagine you get home from the gym when you've just depleted glycogen out of your muscles, and then you just have fish and a, <laughs> and a rice cake. And you, <laughs> or not even rice cake, fish and vegetables. Yeah. And you're like, your body wants carbs, so that's when you want to feed it. But people get it all backwards. Yeah. With, yeah. And that's when, you know, there's certain, uh, certain, what should we say, methodologies from coaches in, in the industry, bigger names, that say you shouldn't have carbs at certain times of the day and what have you. And it's like, well, it comes down to compliance. Yeah. And your lifestyle. Yeah, and your lifestyle. Me, personally, when I finish the gym, I know that I'm fucking starving. So I need a big meal. I like to have something sort of sweet to go in me straight away. So cereals is, is an amazing one for me. But for me, I have fucking half a box of cereal. Can you stop saying things like that? So, really it's nice. delicious. <laughs> But uh, yeah, just even a small thing for some people just yeah. is that 10% that's going to just hit the spot, you know, that, yeah. 
that G spot well, of I, mean, like I need to be protein shake and some rice cakes yeah. or you know a bit of fruit protein oats stuff. for yeah. example is is we're so lucky these days with the certain foods that we can have like diet foods and sugar free foods and and like protein powders that actually taste quite nice because mm. they used to taste fucking dreadful. And I think another big one that people do that train in the evening is they um, often do a thing where they'll train, say so finish training at six six thirty. And this was a discussion I had a client with a client the other day. And then she waits for her partner to get home and then they cook dinner together, which is nice. Mm. But she ends up binging between the time of getting home from the gym and him having dinner. Yeah. Because, and then she does it when he's not there because, again, you get embarrassed about binge eating. And then she's not hungry for dinner. And I said, well, why don't you just have something as soon as you leave the gym? Exactly. Have something in your car. Have a shake. Whatever. And just something that kind of satiates you. But have a little bit of cereal when you get in the door. A portion controlled amount that you can track. And then you're consciously making that decision to eat. And then your dinner's going to be a little lighter on carbs because yep. you've already had some. We did that for a week and she's already been killing it. Like yeah. simple little things like that. Like, I, I have one of my guys. Um, he literally eats a chocolate bar every single day. It's probably me. Around training. <laughs> you eat two chocolate bars. <laughs> but, hey, calories. <laughs> exactly. You need, the, you need the calories. But every day um, after training, eats a chocolate bar. Purely because he knows, okay, uh, my blood sugar levels have gone down. I have the calories for it. I don't need to feel bad about it. Yeah. Um, fuck it. I'll have a chocolate bar. Yeah. And it keeps him consistent. Exactly. That's the same thing a lot of my girls that buy those. Them know, goes and eats his dinner. You know, if like Freddo Frogs portioned out that are. You oh, know, how good are they? Curly yeah. Whirlies used to be one I yeah, used to and have. Yeah, and chomps. Yeah, when I first started tracking macros, I used to have like a chomp a day. And it was with my yeah. post workout because they're quite low in fat. I'd have a protein shake and a chomp and a couple of rice cakes and I was happy days. And then I'd get home and then have my salmon and vegetables or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what about other psychological ones? I mean, physiological. So we've talked about uh, lack of nutrient quality in your diet, missing out mm. on fiber, um, not really structuring your meals. I think plan. That's what, yeah, planning. I think planning yeah. is a big one. That's yeah. why a lot of when you're starting out, uh, when I have new clients, I say to them just in the beginning to get used to tracking macros. I like you to actually plan your food the night before. Yeah. Just, even just stuff. even just roughly even three meals I three, exactly yeah Probably so you know least, roughly what you're gonna have yeah brekkie uh, whatever snack your lunch and then kind of you know if that's if you train in the afternoon yeah and then kind of back those meals out if you're a morning trainer probably plan a post training meal, yeah pre training meal yeah yeah and I find that it, well, there's nothing worse than getting to the end of the day and having no carbs next to no fat and like a hundred grams of protein to egg eat whites it is. egg whites <laughs> and chicken breast with no sauce and it's just shit you know. Yeah. And your compliance is going to be rubbish. You're going to go, I'm not going to eat fucking 400 grams of chicken breast. Yeah. I'm going to go get pizza. Because you've been at work putting your hand in the cookie jar. Because you've yeah. been trying exactly, to yeah. a morning snack to bring with yeah. you like a tub of yogurt and some fruit and some yeah. it, it It can be annoying in the start, but in the long run, it works so much better. Yeah. And it's having that willpower as well to make those conscious decisions throughout the day. So mm. that when you know when are the times that I most commonly binge... How do I actually set my day up so that I'm structured better to reduce the chances of that happening rather mm. than just going, oh, whoops, I had a binge again. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think the last one is I, I, I don't believe in this too much in terms of you hear it when someone says to you, uh, maybe you're just thirsty when you're hungry. They say, oh, I, I feel like someone to eat. And they're like, maybe you're just thirsty, have some water. I do, however, think that, again, people don't drink enough water. Dehydration, I so think. So dehydration is a big yeah, one. Yeah. And, and tri- like thinking that trigger wrong. Absolutely. You know, it's like if you drink more water, your stomach is going to be slightly more full That's of something. It's the fullness, not yeah. just the dehydration. Because there's stretch receptors in your stomach. Yeah. So that tells you, okay, you've eaten quite a lot. Yeah, So exactly. you probably need to stop eating now. Yeah. So exactly. water has its place and it's not just like, it can make you feel fuller. So when you're dieting, drinking more water Absolutely. very yeah. much helps. All the girls actually were joking last week with peak week and they were like, oh, I'm surprised I'm not hungry in peak week. And I'm like, yeah, because you're drinking like five, six liters of yeah. water a day. Like, that's, that's your new yeah. food. Yeah, Zero, it's like peak week, like Zero like calorie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Fill up on water and dust. I think that's, um, I think that's most of the... I'm trying to think of any other physiological ones. Um... I would say meal spacing as well. So sometimes when people like utilize yeah, too many calories early on in the day, yeah. don't have anything left over, then their calories also, like we said, your calories are probably just going too low. And the good way to think about this That's is if one. you are starving and it's genuine hunger, and there's a big difference between boredom hunger yeah. and genuine hunger where your stomach is churning and you are ravenous. Now, if you're at that point with hunger, 
then you maybe need to have a look at your results. So for example, if you drop, have been dropping a kilo a week for the last five weeks and you are starving and you're on the borderline of wanting to go and have a binge, maybe just up your calories a little yeah. bit. Because a kilo a week of like weight loss is huge. If you're 60 kilos. Absolutely. Like, you're 200, 200 kilos. 50, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But if you are, yeah, a 60 kilo female dropping a kilo a week and starving, wouldn't you be better off maybe just slowing yeah. down the rate of fat it's loss? too fast. Eating a little bit more food, but being compliant to that, even throwing in a refeed on the weekend yep. or something like that, spreading your calories out going, and that's the other thing to look at, the distribution of calories. If you find that you're binge eating on the weekends, and something I would do a lot with my clients is go, cool, if you're pretty compliant Monday to Friday and you're more of a social eater and that's yeah. when you're tempted, how about we go say... 1,700 calories Monday to Friday, and then on Saturday and Sunday, 2,000 calories on both days. Yep, exactly what I do. Whatever. Yeah. You want to, again, talk to your coach. So rather than if you have a coach, and this is a good one for clients, and you're struggling, don't just check in and go, oh, I fucked up again this week. Go, hey, coach, I find the weekend's really hard. Can we figure out something around this? I'm really good Monday to Friday, and then allow them to come up with some solutions for yep. you. Um, rather than just kind of going, oh, I suck at this. You mm. know what I mean? Because there is a way that you can, again, calorie balance to still be in a deficit Absolutely, yeah. whilst doing that. Um, or like we said, you might just need to chunk your calories up 200 calories a day. Um, or if you love food, the other thing I say is, would you be happy to train a bit more? Yeah. Because you can create an energy yep. deficit. It doesn't need to be a calorie deficit from food. Mm. So you could go, I say this to the girls a lot, if you love food and you don't want to go with any low with calories, but we've got a plateau in fat loss, are you happy to do... You know, an extra two walks a week for 45 yeah. minutes or something like that. Um, I, I prefer that when I'm dieting. To Much do prefer. more cardio and eat more food. Um, Absolutely, because you can drop the calories but keep the nutrients high. Yes, you feel good. So your right, micros yeah. actually feel good. So you can actually be like, you, sometimes you get this weird, um, is it, I don't know if it's, um, if you're delusional or not, but it's, uh, what's the word, is it? Uh, I can't think of it. You're right. No, can't think of it anyway. But it, your micronutrients, you've just smashed them all. You've hit them all perfectly. That even though when you're on low calories, you actually feel great sometimes. because you're eating really good <laughs> yeah. food. Yeah, yeah, sometimes, not yeah. all the time. Until you get super lean, yeah. and you're just gonna feel like shit. Yeah. But then sometimes when you're on high calories, you feel like shit because you're not because you're eating the wrong foods. Oh, you're sluggish and yeah. you're carrying too much body fat. And yeah. And yeah, I mean, there are things where your body, you binge on certain foods. Like That's one thing I asked, um, I actually asked one of my clients the other day this. They said, oh, I just went and smashed this, that, and the other, and it was ice cream and milk and yogurt. And I was like, what do you think the trend of that is? And it was dairy, dairy and she actually has osteopenia. So mm -hmm. her body was like, I'm craving calcium. Interesting. Yeah. So, and protein, because she doesn't eat enough protein. So. Mm -hmm. Think about that. To those things yeah. sometimes as well. I find that a lot with clients who overconsume on things like pizza and savory, yeah. and it's actually just salt. Salt. So yeah. they've often been eating and way, too, way too and clean. Chips and... Like they've been eating they clean, and I'll say, "Are you adding salt to your meals?" And they're like, yeah. "No." Oh no! No. Salt no. Yeah. yeah. So I think a lot of the time listening to that, and again, if you're someone like me who's more overconsuming on sweets, then a big solution for me with that was from more physiological standpoint was I used to get really creative and I actually made a recipe ebook, which is called yeah, Sweet did. Treats. Plug. Um, so it's on my website. I think it's like 20 bucks or something. But it's kind of like lower calorie versions of a mm. lot of like food cravings. Like I've made like protein cheesecakes and yeah. things like that. I need to probably like yeah, actually make some good ones, that yeah. <laughs> um, It's probably a good idea for pregnancy to get my protein <laughs> up. But yeah, making, being more creative with sweet foods was a big one for me and replacing sugar with stevia, replacing things like that where you yeah. can... I have to be a little careful with like diet foods. Um, with IBS, you need to be a little conscious of those yeah, things. The sugar alcohols. But yeah, but absolutely, just being careful with that sort of stuff. But definitely, being create more creative with your meals, one hundred percent with your calories, rather than going, oh, I can't make that meal taste good because you know I can't put a kilo of cheese on it. So like you can buy, <laughs> you can find a low calorie That's, cheese yeah, out there. Yeah, that mozzarella from Coles, Woolworths. You know Coles. It's right. Coles. Yeah, yeah. yeah, brilliant, lovely. Yeah. There, but when we said that last time on the podcast, it was always sold out because you know, yeah, it's, it's terrible, it's, yeah, it's awful. <laughs> That's happened to a few things. There was something else we had, and uh, <laughs> yeah, bagels, bagels, yeah, no, but everyone ate all my fucking bagels. <laughs> We're Got just not it. going to tell people what yeah. suburb we live in. It's nah. so like when I put food on Instagram, people go, which colours did you get that from? Yeah. I'm not fucking not telling. <laughs> one that I want to admit to you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, Before I go stock up. Yeah. Okay, so there's some of the physiological yeah. ones to have a think about. And I think listening to these, be honest with yourself. 
and going, maybe I've also just been in a calorie deficit for too fucking long. Yeah. And I need to have a period of reverse dieting, bringing my calories up so the next time I diet, I've got more food to do that from. I like to look at the physiological before I look at the psychological as well. 100%, yeah. Because sometimes you're thinking, this could be this massive thing that's going on in my brain and my body. Like, No, it's probably just something very obvious, very physiological. And the other ones that we didn't touch on, just to finish off on there, uh, lack of sleep, huge one. Huge one. If you are lacking sleep, that's for me, a big one when I overeat. I wouldn't say, again, I don't binge, but I notice myself more consciously overeating and picking up food because you think in your brain, food equals energy. And that's a big thing I have to say to myself. Well, sometimes you're better off having a 20-minute nap than eating that whatever. Absolutely. Because it's not going to satiate you. And a lot of the time when you're tired, you'll go for the sugary things because, again, it's a quick rush of energy. So I think look at your lifestyle variables for in your sure. food. Stress. Are you getting enough sleep? Nice, yeah. Nice. Are you stressed, which is more That's psychological? Sure, yeah. um, is it that time of the month as a female? Yep. Um, again, don't use that as an excuse, but be aware of it. Mm. And often around that time of the month, you might need more sleep. You might yeah. need more water. Well, you might need a slight calorie bump. Yeah, exactly. Like a, a diet break. Absolutely. I've got some of my girls who do three weeks of dieting and then one week diet break, and they cycle mm. that. One of my ladies in America who's probably listening to that, this um, cast, and she does awesome on that. And we've been dropping, like, I think we've dropped almost 15 pounds, which is about seven kilos. Seven kilos yeah. And we've been doing that for um, on and off for like five, six months now, kind of yeah. through that process. And she's very happy with getting slower results, but we get results. They'll stay off. Every yeah. time she's in her diet weeks, we drop. And then she pretty much stays the same or goes up about half a pound whenever we do our diet break weeks. And then back into it. And she's not, not super lot, strict yeah. with her tracking either. Like, she's a little more relaxed. She's vegan, like, does a great job, does her macros. And that for her mentally, having that diet break every fourth week, mm. loves it. Like, because yep. she plans social events, she plans, she's got a kid, like, birthdays, things like that. And she'll say, hey, coach, I've got this coming up. Can we maybe move it forward or back a week? And mm. we kind of work around it. So thinking about things like that, maybe I need more refeeds, maybe I need more diet breaks, maybe I need to go slow with my dieting, maybe I need to have a break from dieting. Maybe I need to be more honest with my coach about how I'm struggling yeah. with these things. Um, but then be realistic with the results. That's Don't go, one. okay, we're going slow, we're dieting, so I still expect to drop 500 grams yeah. a week. Well, maybe you'll drop 300 grams a week, but yeah. you'll be compliant and you'll be able to stick to it for yeah. 10 weeks and lose, you know, four kilos, which is four kilos more than what you would have lost if you were binge eating. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mental, oh. mental game. Oh, all right. You asked me some questions about this one, so... I think, as a coach, what do you what do you think are your main uh, psychological triggers Unhappiness. that you work with? Unhappy is a big it's one, a big isn't one. It? and that's guys and girls. That's very broad. Yeah. So then again, if a client says to me, "Yeah, yeah I'm just not happy with life," mm. that's a big one to hit you with. And I think the best thing you do to start with is a what's causing you to be unhappy. Yeah. And then it's gratitude and perspective. You know, and perspective. Hundred percent. Like, and if it's Again, it's just such a big one that we could talk about a whole nother podcast on it and we maybe we'll get Jason on for another one. But mm. you want to think about a lot of time clients won't just straight up say unhappiness. Like you won't get that very often. You'll get things like, no. I'm feeling sad. Yeah. I'm feeling down. And I'll go, Cool, so what are you feeling sad about? And then yeah. they'll go, I'm unhappy because I don't um, have a job that I'm passionate about or I don't have a partner and I'm 35 and I'm worried that I'll never meet someone and I want to have a family um, or I'm sad because I'm stressed financially or I'm sad because um, I haven't got any great friends I've just moved to Australia from overseas and I feel a little alone or whatever it may be like there's there's so many different reasons as to why people would be unhappy and I think there's a big start point is just pinpointing what that unhappiness is being driven from um another huge one and probably the one that is the most common is people being unhappy about their bodies <laughs> yeah like number one i would say bodies and then probably lifestyle factors are probably the two biggest ones that people are most unhappy about um and with the body one it's it's a hard one as a coach because if people say they're unhappy about their bodies but then they're binge eating it's like you're doing self-sabotaging behavior which is pretty clear so then what strategies do we need to put in place to improve that? Mm. Are you going to love your body more by dieting and trying to attain this body? Or are you going to love your body more by maybe taking a break from it and working on other areas of self-love? Yeah. Like going uh, And also, are the body goals that you're attaining for realistic? And that's probably a big one as well with um, unhappiness around body image. That was a big one for me, was that I was trying to look like a Victoria's Secret model. Yeah. Now, I don't, I'm not six foot tall. Yeah, you're not the I'm, tallest person. I'm 5'4". I'm not a midget. Yeah. But I'm, I'm average female height. 
I'm apparently, slightly above average. Yeah. Apparently, apparently it's five threes. The average. We all say we're above average. So you're below average. I yeah. <laughs> on, on what? What are we talking about? As a lie. Just tight. <laughs> yeah. Just how I go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, that big one for me was that I was trying to be skinny. And that just wasn't working for me. Like, I was trying to be super skinny and long You squat limbs. 140 kilo. I don't think there's a Victoria's Secret model that squats 140 kilo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe. So, again, it's just not my build. I've got an athletic shape. And a big thing for me was that I had to be truly honest with myself about where my body at is at in life and how I looked. And that can be quite confronting. Especially with social media these days. 100%. To sit there and go, yep, I look like this and it is what it is. Yeah. I can do something about it. I can improve, but I'm never going to look like this person. Mm. And that, I think, is a big message Not to because all the like, you never will because they look much better than you. No. They just don't look anything like you. The, got your Height, shape, shape, structure. Yeah, and so what's the point in trying to attain for that? Because yeah. every time you get a result, you're not going to be happy. Right. Because then you never look like that. And I want to look like Thor Bjornsson. You know, <laughs> he's, so. he's six foot ten or something and like you're that. Five foot. I'm five nine on in trainers. And is he younger than you as well? How is he younger than me? <laughs> Looks ten years older than me. That's the other thing. You could be an eighteen year old, but this was my problem. I was like eighteen, nineteen, looking at women that were thirty, yeah. and going, "Oh, I want to look like that." Yeah. And you've got these beautiful curves and yeah. shape and things. It's like. You might when you're older. You might in 12 years but time, yeah. Let's pop the kid out. But yeah. um, it's being realistic with, being very realistic and truthful with where your body is, but then not sitting there and beating yourself up and picking yourself apart about mm. it. And that's really important. Instead going, you know, stand in the mirror, and this is a task I get a lot of my clients to do, and say, what do I actually love about myself? And you might look and go, nothing. And that's something that I hear a lot. And that's you, that should being a brat, really. Yeah, 100%. It's not being grateful. Like, if you honestly stood there and looked in the mirror and then you have a think about all the people that have genuine body issues and I'm talking about things like loss of limbs, yeah. um, you know, diseases, um, skin issues spinal and conditions, bifida. spinal mm. bifida, um, they have um, cleft palates, they've mm. got all of these sort of things. Do, are you really that ungrateful about no. what you see in the mirror now? Some of those people are still very happy. Absolutely. <laughs> I um, had a girl come and do my hair last weekend for a photo oh, shoot. Yeah. A lovely girl off Instagram that DM'd me and said, I'll come do it. I'm not even a hairdresser. 6 a.m. on a Sunday. And I was chatting to her. And you can't help kind of looking when somebody's different in society. And that's not in a judgmental no. way. That's just Curi- it's curiosity. curiosity. And I was looking at her and I was like, this girl's stunning, beautiful girl. But there's something I could just tell in her face that wasn't 100%. Um, I'm trying to be very political in what I say here, but just not um, something different, you know, to yeah. the norm of what you look at in society. And then she, we get chatting and she's like, yeah, I've got a um, pretty much like a fake eye. And I was like, okay, it makes sense now. Mm. Like I didn't want to think that yeah. I was staring at it, but it was, yeah. And she talked to me about the fact that she lost her eye. Um, because as a child, she dealt with um, brain tumors and hmm. severe issues and all of this. And I was like, this woman's fucking amazing. She's like, diabetic as well. Yeah, and she's diabetic. Type yeah. 1 diabetic. Type 1 not diabetic. Type two. Not, yeah. not the fat type of diabetic. No. <laughs> not the I've given myself diabetes. <laughs> yeah. Not the, the I'm unhealthy I'm born diabetic. with it. Yeah. yeah, proper type 1 diabetes. So, um, yeah, and listening to her story, and I was like, wow, like, we can be so ungrateful for the fact that we get a bloody pimple on our face, yeah. yet this girl has had her her eye removed mm. is amazing and yes, was she, she happy was so happy yeah, exactly. and so grateful yeah. for life and um also she's infertile and that was another big one like and that was a big discussion that we were having and she was still happy and grateful and i said how do you stay in that state and she said well i'm here and i'm alive mm. i had cancer it's not my only I, thing no yeah. and you know so i think that gratitude perspective um bring yourself back to reality and Instead of comparing yourself to the people that in your eyes have everything, compare to, compare yourself to the people in your eyes that have less than. Um, For sure. Or not even compare, but just see that and like take it in and go, wow, like I need to spend some time being a little more grateful because spending my time focusing on wanting to look like that girl on Instagram that probably photoshops her photos anyway and, you know, constantly has perma makeup and Mm. tan. No one fucking wakes up like that. (laughs) Like, let's be realistic. Uh, You know, I do. Yeah, we are just Mr. Perfect on this podcast. I don't don't wear makeup. (laughs) Sean doesn't binge eat. He wakes up (laughs) flawless. (laughs) I really don't. (laughs) You're actually pretty annoying because you're kind of close to perfect. Why, thank you. You know, that's what I was fishing for. Thank you very Um, much. You do have a really annoying problem of a constant erection like, yeah it's quite yeah it's yeah it's, it's really awkward in public 
you know, <laughs> training my tonight, no, training my seventy five year old woman. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's actually fact. <laughs> you know, I was wearing the wrong shorts. Absolutely. My grey shorts are like very but at the same showy. Time, people are going to listen to this and think that you've had this privileged lifestyle when you know. had a pretty tough upbringing, mm. and be, I think because of that is why you are the way you are today. Because yeah. you weren't spoiled and you had to work for things, and now you appreciate the things yeah. that you do have. And you know, you didn't have food as a kid, like you no. said. Like your dinner was potatoes or whatever your mum could afford with two raising two boys as a single mum. That's like, why, like the easiest way to make me happy, other food. other than food a BJ, <laughs> yeah. is food. Like Maz, Maz bought me a hundred dollar meat voucher, yeah, yeah. amazing present. If yeah. anyone I listening to that, this, it's my much. it's my birthday in two weeks' time. It's a terrible suggestion when I. Oh yeah, hundred dollars worth of steak and ribs. Stunk out the house for five hours for delicious yeah. barbecue ribs. Hundred percent. And it's funny how they again, again going a bit off topic, but you talk about things like love languages, and Sean's is obviously gifts of affection. He just wants to have a <laughs> touch and feel. <laughs> Whereas, like my thing is more like gifts of service, not in the sense of gifts, but like when Sean cleans the house or he's taking the dogs out for a walk. That's called or- chore play, by the way. <laughs> chore play. If you're chore wondering play. what that's about, <laughs> so I cleaned our car the other day. I take the bins out. You know, I do some. I clean the toilets, pick up the dog poo that's chore play chore play yeah, yeah so uh, all comes out in the wash go, you've done nothing you've done fuck all you're not going to get lucky if you've done <laughs> exactly. fuck all exactly yeah. you know that's, that's my tip for him yeah. <laughs> should, use, should use that one damn <laughs> and mine's feed your man <laughs> yeah. simple yeah um, now I've got off topic but yeah it's just talking about I guess gratitude and perspective and I think a big one is finding the reasons other reasons why you love yourself yeah, is a big one yeah. is save yourself you know yeah. it's yes you can hire a coach who can point you in the right direction and be the be the catalyst of you going in the right direction but in the end of the day you've got to do the work yeah. so that's why you were talking about coach hoppers yeah they're hopping from coach to coach because they're not taking that accountability themselves. They're going, someone else will fix me. Yeah, someone else will do it. It's like taking the magic pill. There's no magic pill. Yeah, it's like going to the doctor and, again, they're like, oh, you've got, you're potentially going to have type 2 diabetes if you keep going down the path you're going, but you've got to change some lifestyle factors and lose a bit of weight and blah, blah, blah. And they go, nah, just put me on. Duramine. Duramine. Yeah, Yeah, I'll just take Duramine, you know, until you come off Duramine, then you're fucked. Or people that get, and not everyone, because I don't generalize that one, but no. again, issues with more like lap band surgeries and stuff like that. Um, again, it's kind of band-aiding like a lot of some of the other problems. Some people need it from a health standpoint, but not a lot. A lot of them are more lifestyle variables. Again, that's band-aiding. Well, why are you struggling again with binge eating? Because a lot of people get lap band and things like that because they're binge eating and over-consuming. So they think, okay, well, by, you know, chopping out half of my stomach or putting a tie in there, mm. then that's going to stop that fullness. But you hear of horror stories of people there's that are getting those surgeries liquid and calories. blending food, yeah. blending calories, and yeah. then making their digestive system even worse. Mm. So, again, it's like, it's all these band-aiding problems, like coach hopping, that's not really fixing the actual problems. So, Here's, yeah. here's what I have for you. What about uh, feeder families? Mm. One nationality uh, or race of people, wogs, <laughs> you know, and their feeder families. The old Italian families, yeah. Yeah, that's a hard one to get around because then that comes down to binging and overconsumption. Yeah. You know, and planning. So what's your question there? Like what you solution? Yeah, solutions is to that say... psychological or is that physiological? People putting food in front of you? Yeah, that's a hard one because it's kind of a bit of both really. So I guess my struggles with it a bit more has been with my family um, commenting. A big one I think with people is people commenting on your weight. Yeah. I'd say it would be a big place to start. So I had some clients, uh, a couple of old clients that were prepping for shows. Um, Diana would be one of them, um, a couple of others in the past. They go to family gatherings and old Nonna would come over and go, Oh, you look so skinny. You're looking thin, you know. You need to eat some fun, eh? That's really loud. Yeah. <laughs> I wake up Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and, and that can be challenging because you think you're putting on all this hard work and you're proud of how you look. And as soon as somebody comments on you and says, Well, you actually look a bit too skinny. Or the opposite, you're working with a coach. This is a big one that I get. And people think because you're working with a coach that you're going to be getting smaller, yeah. but you might be trying to build your metabolism and get healthier. And your coach has said, we're not going to diet down for the first five or six weeks. And then you've got your boyfriend at home and he walks in the door every night and he goes, can't believe you're paying a coach, you know, a hundred bucks a week. Yeah. You're getting fatter. I or preferred you, you when you were thinner. I preferred you when you were thinner. <laughs> well, number one, you dump him. Yeah. Um, but number two, 
is that it's it's people's comments like that where they're misinformed or uneducated mm. around what you're doing. It doesn't mean they're a bad person. It just means that they just have no concept of yeah. like what you're actually going through. But you've also got to build a thick enough skin to be happy with what you're achieving in your own results rather than worrying about what other people think about you. Um, yep. the amount of times when I've been dieting down for shows and people have said dumb shit to me or the opposite, coming out of a show and I gained a bit of weight and people are like, oh, you're looking a bit uh, fuller. Like... Uh, <laughs> Guess you're not dying it's to your show anymore. Saying, yeah. <laughs> You've gotten fat. Um, exactly. But if, if I didn't have a thick skin and people said stuff like that to me, which I probably was in the past, that would then probably trigger a binge because I'm like, well, I'm a failure or people, I've yeah, I'll probably, die you know, I'll start dieting again. I'll do another show. Um, so again, focusing on fat loss for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a huge one is people focusing on fat loss for the wrong reasons. They're focusing on yeah. fat loss because they think it's going to make them happy. Yeah. They think that if, someone else. if they get that goal body, they'll be happy. Um, yeah, for a partner because they think their partner's only going to stay with them if they're really skinny, but maybe they've met their partner when they've only been eating a thousand calories a day and overtraining, and that's not sustainable. No. And then they're trying to uphold that, and then as a result of that, they're binge eating. So that's a combination of the physiological and the psychological. Yeah. Um, another big ones would be a uh, big one we had questions about was boredom eating. Um, I know it sounds harsh, but I feel like that's just a bit of lack of uh, self control. Yeah. And, and don't um, be bored. Don't be bored. Find that, something it else. Is time to be bored. Ah. And people tell me that I miss, time I miss, to, I miss being miss bored. bored. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> like, we have a kid. Oh. We're not going to be bored ever again. <laughs> but honestly, like, it baffles me when people say that I boredom eat, probably because I'm a workaholic. Yeah. And I don't really have much downtime to be bored. No. Um, by the time we finish work most nights and then we talk to each other as yeah. a couple and we have dinner or we play with the dogs or whatever, like, we don't really sit around. Boredom eating. I'd say realistically, um, is find something else that's Yeah, and I think I think it's more common when you're single, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, I hear it a lot more with women who are single who have say a nine to five job, they don't have a pet or an animal or anything like that. Yeah, dog. Get a dog, hundred percent. Um we're just gonna tell everyone to get dogs. So yeah. <laughs> rescue dog. Let's try and, let's try and sneak yeah. that into every yeah. podcast. But adopt. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's a big one is um yeah, but then you've got to think, well, is that boredom? Do I need a hobby or am I unhappy about something? Mm. And that's important. You might not be unhappy. You honestly might just genuinely be a bit bored. Yeah. And then you've got to go, okay, a good one I always say to the girls is what activity can you do with your hands? Because your hands are need- <laughs> Raises eyebrows. Has a fat. Has a fat, yeah. Well, that's my hobby. You know what? Right. Burns you calories. Know, you know, if you you know if you're feeling a bit bored, maybe you like Miranda off Sex and City, yeah. and you need to just get a little bit moist. And if but... you're wearing your Fitbit and you shake that around a bit, that actually gets your steps up <laughs> a bit more. Steps, you know? the right hand. Yeah, fat fat bit. <laughs> but what I was trying to say was try to do things that you're not either in the kitchen or you are using your hands to eat because yeah. you need your hands to eat. Um, and don't take up smoking. No, That's another absolutely. One, yeah. So yeah, get out of the kitchen is a big one. Don't just linger in the kitchen. When you're meal prepping, um, make sure that you get in, get out, you have a goal. And then if you are that boredom kind of eater, well, don't be bored. Find other hobbies. Um, read a book. A book's a good one. You've got to use your hands again when you read a book. Yeah. When you watch TV, you're sitting there like a potato. Yeah. And you can... Another good one I suggest for when you're watching TV is sit on the floor and have a stretch. Um, that's a really good one because it kind of, again, takes your mind off those things. And you're probably just sitting there with bad posture anyway, so you may as well yeah. get down on the floor and have a little stretch. Um, other solutions, remove yourself away from the kitchen. So if your lounge room is combined with your kitchen, like ours is, maybe go into your bedroom and go in mm. there where you're away from stuff. Um, another good solution is phone a friend. That is a good one. Just oh, yeah. think you're on who wants to be a millionaire. <laughs> and you've got a friend that's like, your, again, not your coach. Your coach doesn't want you to call them at 9 yeah. p.m. at night because you're bored and you feel like eating a slice of cake. <laughs> um, I've had that before. Yeah, <laughs> so lot, yeah. that is not what a coach is for. Um, but it, it can be a case of you've got another friend that might be struggling with something like this or another single friend, just leave them a text message and say, hey, like, it's a little bore. What are you up to tonight? You know, do you want to have a quick chat? And it doesn't even need to be about your food, but it's just a case of mm. jumping on the phone to someone, having some human connection. Um, another good suggestion is don't sit there and scroll Instagram whilst you're also snacking because you're probably going to sit there and then compare yourself to other women's bodies whilst yeah. then self-sabotaging. Or it could do the opposite. You go look at people and go, 
Oh, that's motivating. You're getting a gym here. Yeah, 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 exactly. I find it actually does the opposite for me. I'm not really someone who gets triggered anymore by other people's bodies in a negative way. No. Um, it'll more go, oh, fuck, I need to pull my finger out. <laughs> or like once I've had this yeah, kid, like, so, that's yeah. motivating. Um, so for me, it's kind of the opposite. Or I look back at you know old photos of where I've been or whatever. I'd rather gain motivation for myself than someone else because it's a bit more realistic. Absolutely. Um, so there's some simple solutions. Another really good one that is a massive one is... Reflection time, like sit yeah. in the evening. This is a great one when you're single because you've got all the time in the world to do mm. it. And it's the shit that I miss doing, being stuck with old mayo over here. But <laughs> She's pointing at Buffy. If I'm going to do my stuff now, I don't do it in the evening because that's when I spend time with Sean. So yeah. I kind of do my mindset work usually in the morning um, because, yeah, we, we don't get a lot of time together during the day. And then I will generally do my gratitude and things like that in the morning. Mm. Um, sometimes we do it together. Sometimes we'll kind of say, like, how was your day? You know, what were you grateful yeah. for? You know, what was good? What was bad? If we also catch ourselves getting into a bit of a negative mindset, which you can do with your partner, like you yeah. can kind of both have a shitty day, not a shitty day, but maybe a tough client or something's happened at work and we both get home and we're both like, oh, fuck, I had to deal with old, old yeah. mate today or yeah. whatever. And we try to kind of pull, old our, mate. pull ourselves out of that um, by having it's not, a yeah. perspective. Like, I think because we both understand that, all right, it's nice to have a, get something off your chest and be have a small rant, event, yeah. but then get the fuck on with it. Yeah. Get yeah. back into a good mindset. Or take accountability. It's the longer you stay in a negative mindset, the longer you stay in there permanently, I yeah, find, as well. 100%. And even that taking accountability. So, like, for example, if, say, um, you know, I've got to deal with something with staff because I've got, like, a fair few staff now working for me, which is awesome, but it adds more stress. It's yeah. definitely more stressful having staff and not having staff. If, when I was working for myself, there was far less um, stress from a workplace yeah. than having people that I'm now responsible for financially and also that are working for me within a business. Yep. Um, and I definitely have my days where I go, <laughs> maybe fuck this. Fuck I'm it. just going to no. work for myself again um, and not worry about anyone else, but then the community can't grow. So, again, it's being in that mindset of, Something happens and say a staff member screws up or whatever or they're hounding me all day with things because they need help. And rather than sitting down and going, oh, God, like that was really, you know, a tough day. It's kind of going, you know what, like I need to take accountability as a boss in that maybe I haven't set things up correctly where they know what to do or they are in a position where they've got all the tools that they need. Maybe mm. I need to put more effort in or yeah. I need to do this. Same with as a coach. If you've got a client who's struggling with binge eating, same thing, and you're getting home and you're like, oh, Susan keeps binging. Yeah, what's wrong with them? What's wrong with them rather than going, okay, this is a co-effort. I'm not yeah. going to take all the accountability yeah. because I can't control what a client does 24 hours a day, but how can I help her? What more can I do? Um, and that's probably something that you can even do in a reflection sense. Mm. So even if something happens in your day, rather than getting in the door at night and going, oh my God, let's say I have a lot of clients who are nurses and teachers. And that's a big one because you're dealing with, again, people all day. Similar industry to us in that sense. Yeah. So you're dealing with relationships. So you're going to have to deal with different personalities. And you might get home some days and want to vent and rant and go, oh my God, I had that patient at work today that's so fucking annoying and blah, blah, blah. And now I feel like shit and now I hate my job and now I'm going to go binge eat on mm. some whatever, cheese. Cheese. <laughs> of all the foods you could think of, you thought of cheese. It's the one food that I want when I'm pregnant that I can't eat. I mean like soft cheese. Like all I want is a wheel a tri- of camembert. A nice triple cream brie. Camembert's in my jam. Oh, okay. Yeah, a wheel of camembert. A whole I'd baked like, one. When I push this kid out, I'd like a wheel of camembert. So That's going to be a push present. Yeah, a wheel I'm of gonna camembert. I'm going to get you on the size of this table. And my Range Rover. Oh, okay, yeah. 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 I'll get you um, a toy Range Rover. You probably will. Probably get one for our daughter. One of those little oh, ones. So I'll yeah. her name then. Um, but yeah, I think that's... I can't remember what I was talking about. Self-reflection so. time. Oh, yeah. Self-reflection time. So instead... Going, you know what? What are the things I'm really grateful about for my job? Yep. Instead of going, that one client. Did that one client really ruin the fact that you're passionate about what yeah. you do? No, they're usually just a fuckhead. Okay? Yeah. So instead, go, okay, maybe I either one, can't work with that client anymore, or two, we need to come up with some solutions and strategies yeah. around that. Um, maybe that client's also had a bad day. Maybe they took it out on me. That's yeah. another thing to think about. So it was probably a little aggressive me calling them a fuckhead. But, um, some people are fuckheads. That's true. There yeah. is some people who are just scumbags. Yeah. So, yeah. But sometimes clients will take shit out on you. Yeah. And we get that a lot in our jobs. We can be punching bags sometimes. Mm. Yeah, poor Shawnee's had a few of those. But a couple. Hey, I comp prepped. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's true. You, you can be a punching bag for people if you allow it. Yeah. And that's the other big thing. So you've got to reflect and go, cool, in that situation tomorrow, 
how can I one get them to take some accountability? What can I do? And also, what do I need to let go of? And mm. that's all that the thing that I've talked about before in seminars that I've done is I've got, you need to sometimes do a list of stop, start, keep. So what that means is what is the behavior I'm going to keep doing that's serving me and that's bringing me joy, happiness, moving me towards my goals? What is the shit that I need to stop doing? And that might be whinging, that might be wallowing in self-pity, that might be playing the victim, that might be self-sabotaging with food, that might be boredom eating. And then what am I going to um, start doing that's going to prevent that behavior? So then that might be, cool, put some solutions in place around binge eating. When I get home from work, I'm going to find a friend. I'm Mm. going to do whatever. I'm going to go for a walk. I'm going to get a dog, you know. Um, (laughs) Other ones to start doing would be reflection at night about some wins for the day or some gratitude. So that's a really, really good one is that whole stop, start, keep, um, which rolls in with gratitude. Oh, that's really good reflection um all of that so again it comes back to perspective like you're just gaining a bit of perspective instead of focusing on that one annoying person you had to deal with that day focus on all the 20 other people that you had a good interaction with um or focus on when you get in the door yeah your dog that's there or your partner or that friend that's on the phone to you like focus on all those people rather than allowing one person to turn you into a negative what's that analogy Don't slash the three good tires because you've got one flat. 100%. Yeah. And I think people do that a lot in life. Oh, like, it's such a minor thing can go wrong and then it's like, fuck it, fuck everything. And my day's fucked. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. A bird shit on my window and now I'm not going to work. Yeah. Think, you know? Like, Dude. it's one of those things where, again, it kind of comes back to, um, yeah, just being a little more rational. I think yeah. it's a big one. Very good one, it's yeah. It's irrational thought. And yeah. I think a lot of binge eating comes from irrational thought and irrational decisions. Mm. When you're not kind of actually consciously being in the moment of going, well, am I actually hungry or am I bored? Yeah. What are some solutions that I can do if I'm bored? And that's what's psychological. This. Yeah. And a big one I say to people is slow down your thoughts. Yeah. Um, your thoughts are probably very rushed. And that's why if you write them down, it slows you down physically, just the art of actually writing down. Yeah, I am a little unhappy with my body right now. Mm. But what can I do about that? Is binge eating going to serve step, that? Am I a step closer or is this going to take me a step exactly. further back? Yeah. yeah, is the behavior I'm about to do going to move me towards my goals or away from my goals? Yeah. And every single day, every single action that you take, think of that mindset. Am I going towards my goals or away from my goals? Yeah. And if everything you're doing is keeps taking a step back, then you're just self-sabotaging. But then you've got to then take accountability for going, why am I doing that? Rather than just going... I self-sabotage. I'm a self-sabotager. That's me. That's yeah. my life. That's almost like You've saying... you branded yourself. Exactly. Yeah. It's like saying I'm you know, unhappy or I have anxiety or this and that. All things that you could overcome with the right tools. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's a big one. But Which again, we've given you. Now. And a lot of people won't agree with that. A lot of people... People that argue and say that you can't cure things like unhappiness or anxiety are people that are not growth-minded. They're... Yeah, I agree they're with They're victims. Yeah. That's, that's all it is. Yeah. Which, again, probably will sound a little harsh, but it's... You have to... I think when it comes to psychology, sometimes there is a little bit of harshness to it. Yeah. You've got to be real about it. Yeah. Otherwise, you'll never move forwards. No. So, but I think I think that's a great way of wrapping it up. Yeah. Is... Um, I really like the stop, start... What keep. Was it? Keep, yeah. I think mm-hmm. it's a really good one. And you can use that for physiological and psychological as well. So. 100%. Any other little questions uh, that we yeah, had? I'm just kind of reviewing that. A lot of people have kind of said, um, is it better to allow yourself to have a little bit more food if you feel like it's going to avoid you binging? 100%. So Absolutely. So we covered that one yeah. earlier on. Better of having, and I always say, have a couple, more of, hundred often calorie, than not. couple, of, uh, have, uh, couple of hundred calories <laughs> of good quality food. Yeah. Don't make it something shit that's not filling. So don't make it, you know, again, it could be if it's not that hungry, but you're just kind of craving something, a couple of squares of chocolate yeah. might be able to do it. But if you're hungry, you want to get in quality food. Yeah. So get in a piece of fruit, get in, you know, a piece of protein, something like that, rather than then having the chocolate if it's a hunger thing. So yeah. you've got to decide, is it a craving? Am I just thinking about that food so much that I know I'm probably going to binge on it and maybe I should just have a little bit? Yeah. Like sometimes starving? you'll do a cheeseburger from yeah. Hung- McDonald's, McDonald's yeah. 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 Because and that's another thing is rationally think about like how many how many calories is that? Yeah, a Mars bar is two hundred and fifty calories. A cheeseburger is two hundred and fifty calories. A Krispy Kreme is two hundred calories. Everyone thinks McDonald's is the devil. Oh, you had a cheeseburger. Even they've what? To just uh, grilled that's meant to be healthy. Yet 
calories in it's a group fucking dreadful like some of them have 45 grams of fat <laughs> yeah how's it healthy yeah. what is healthy what's the difference between that and a, a cheeseburger at exactly it's like the yeah. only big difference is the bun yeah like, really so um absolutely have more have calories more if needed yeah for so a lot of people said how do you fight the urge to binge so exactly like what we said determine if it's psychological or physiological and mm. start there then work out a plan of attack back slow down your thoughts and start to rationalize um, have you eaten good quality diet that day is your mindset in the right place do you need to have a bit of perspective do you need to slow down do you yeah. need more sleep so many variables to think about write a checklist that's yeah. something that I get clients to do stick it on your fridge stick it on your fridge yeah I actually have a free ebook um, on that it's called um, check yourself before you wreck yourself mm. so it's just a very quick little PDF which kind of runs through some of these things and it's all about that about preventing the self sabotage before it occurs yeah. um, so if you want to get your hands on that flick me an email free um, free book yeah it's a free ebook with three e's exactly uh, last question, because um, we pretty much covered, a lot of them are very similar. Um, okay, so how to get over cravings that last a few days, even though I'm eating more than enough. Okay, so I would determine what is more than enough. Yeah. Do you, you? actually think that you are eating enough? Um, I would agree with this for some clients. I have some clients that are on, you know, females, 2,500 calories and they're still hungry. Hmm. But again, I would still address all of those triggers. Maybe it's that time of the month. If you're saying cravings are lasting a few days or what are you craving? Yeah. You know, be specific. If you're craving um, sugar... But you're eating, you know, clean foods for the 2,000 calories, say, that you're eating. Mm. Maybe you need to add in some 5 or 10% foods. And or you're eating a little bit of stuff. too many fats. Or the opposite, As yeah. opposed to, why don't you dial down the fats, raise the carbs. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Or if your goal isn't fat loss, then maybe bump your calories up a little yeah. bit more. Maybe you actually aren't eating enough and you need a little more across the board. Mm. Um, so that's the thing at the end of the day. You've got to figure out... Is a craving a craving or is it just the fact that I'm either, I need to address all of those physiological and psychological factors and then go, do I really want to, or am I just fucking bored and Mm. I'm just thinking about food? Is it in my house? Another big one that girls uh, have asked a lot, is it better to have the food in the house or is it better to remove it? That is very individual Mm, and I'll say that with clients. Um, Some clients are much better to remove it. Me personally, when I'm dieting down, I'm better to not have it in the house. I would Um, say why buy it? Exactly. If I can't fit it in or I can't portion control it easily, yeah. I just won't bother. Don't buy it. Um, but if I am in a maintenance phase or a reversing phase when I feel like my, it's easier to be in a good place with food because you're more satiated and I have less chance of cravings, I'm definitely much better with having it in the house. Yeah. Um, so like we've had box of chocolate in the fridge. You do things like putting your chocolate in the fine. freezer. But I actually just like the taste of um, it. Yeah. Like I eat it like that. It's harder to eat fast definitely. as well. Yeah. So like you have a, you put a dairy milk in a cupboard, it's soft, it melts instantaneously. Yeah. You have it in the freezer, it's yeah, like harder, it's crunchier. Yeah. yeah. So you don't eat as much. Yeah. And that's, yeah. I mean, I just like it. Yeah. Cold chocolate, but... Apparently that's an Australian thing, not an English thing. So mm. you're like, this is weird. Because your chocolate has something that, that makes it melt less as well. Yeah, but I still put it in the freezer. Yeah, you would, eh? So that's just me. But yeah, I think determine what's right for you. Um, I found when I was single and like lived alone, I found it better for me just to not have it in the house. Yeah. Um, definitely. But then my relationship with food was way worse back then as well. So I think it's thinking about what would work for you. Um, and the last kind of question we had was then... Um, pretty much around how do you then get to a good place with food. Um, I think we've kind of wrapped all that up, but I think we'll give you kind of one final tip of how we, I always say to clients that are struggling with binge eating, how would you like to see food and what role does food serve in your life? Hmm. And it's a really important one because a lot of people will be like, well, I just fucking love food. And it's hmm. like, that's fine. But if you love food and you want also want to get a banging body, then we have to be realistic in yeah. what your food relationship is. Priorities be. at that time. Yeah. You know, which one's more of a priority or is there a balance there? Yeah. And is, and the big one that I always say to people with binge eating is the food will always be there. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Like, Post comp is a big one. 100%. When people are like, I don't know whether to have Chinese or KFC or blah, blah, blah. I'm like, why not just have one a week? Yeah. Every week. For six weeks. For yeah. six weeks. And you're done. Rather yeah. than getting off stage, having it all and feeling fucking dreadful. Yeah. And then going, I'll start my diet in four weeks. Yeah. It's like, why not just have a little bit every yeah. single week? That's probably a huge one is trying to not limit yourself so much that you're then feeling like you're missing out. So yeah. um, that's a big one to kind of wrap up with in terms of relationship with food. The food's always going to be there. 
Think about the psychological effects. Think about the physiological that you ran through. Write yourself a checklist if you need to as a bit of a reminder. Yeah. Another big one, if you're going in alone, hire a coach. Yeah. If it's a get, especially more the physiological ones, I would say than the psychological. So if it's the ones where you don't know how to structure your meals, you're hungry all the time, you're binge eating because maybe your diet's pretty shitty, yeah. that's where a nutrition coach will come in, a mm. really good one. Whereas if it's the deeper rooted psychological ones, which you didn't really touch on, like ones where say when you were a child and you were really overweight and your parents kind of forced you, food was love um, and a nurturing tool mm. and then you're still kind of using that when you're sad and down. It's like a worm in your brain that you just can't get rid of. Yeah, then I have that, a couple of clients. Yeah, that. but then if it's really deep rooted, you might need to have, say, a session or two with a psychologist yep. before working with a coach or whilst you're working with a coach. Um, even uh, clients of victims of sexual abuse, things like that, where they've yeah. gained weight because it's a self-defense mechanism all of that's pretty deep rooted. So that's stuff yeah. that, again, your average nutrition coach probably isn't qualified no. to help you with. Um, again, unless you are people that have been doing this for a very long period of time, have done some psychology units as well, yeah. which we both have, um, all of those things. But again, there's still situations where we'll outsource. Absolutely. So, um, yeah. And buy a puppy. Yeah, buy a puppy. Just to two. get that one in there one more time. Or two. Or two. Yeah. Well, From we'll shelters. Let you know if, like, the kid thing helps or hinders yeah eating. that'll be interesting where i want to like stab myself just binging like daily yeah. Let's have to listen to our own podcast yeah yeah <laughs> exactly when the lack of sleep deprivation mm. kicks in so mums that'd be interesting to know but um yeah i think but then i hear a lot of mums saying you're so busy that when you have a kid you forget yeah. to eat and you're kind of like but then that can be a bad trigger for some mums because then they think once the kid goes to sleep then they're oh i need to go and eat yeah yeah, yeah. so i think it's again Think about your lifestyle, like mums, everyone, then you've got to know, okay, well, when I make the kid breakfast, I need to shovel down, you know, something or make a smoothie that I can take with me or do yeah. things And that's that, prioritizing yourself. A hundred percent. As yeah. well as other people. Which is what a lot of mums don't do. Yeah. So, yeah. Look after yourself, mums. Yeah. You're the best. Yeah. I think we'll wrap it up on that. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Tune in next time. We'll yeah. try and be a bit more regular. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we'll I've already pre-recorded the next we'll podcast a, oh okay yeah nice get ready for that one great you're not on it glad I was not there <laughs> you were at work oh okay <laughs> lucky me yeah but if there's anything that you want Sean to do with um, other people or solo solo I don't know about that You've got I'm going solo for like three hours. yeah it'll be an eight hour podcast yeah about all sorts of or things or ten minutes or It'll 10 be, minutes yeah yeah, yeah. yeah uh, that's about it really yeah. you get bored on your own mm. um, okay so yeah let's wrap it up um, anything else exciting coming up to finish oh yes we have just launched our Simple yeah, Moon yeah. Blueprint um, so it's a new coaching program it's a really great one for working on confidence mindset body image and it ends with a bang and photo shoot in Perth so you have to nice. be available for the dates that we're doing it yep. um, which is the end of March and the first weekend in April um, so we pushed it back to then because it's kind of a nice amount of time to motivate you over the Christmas and New Year period or to really get stuck into it once the Christmas and New Year period is gone clarify um, dates again 28th of March and the 4th of April and how, 2020 how do you get more info and contact you so either the link in my bio on Instagram and hit apply very very simply on the team round Instagram or just send me an email direct to info at alisround.com I handle most of the inquiries on the email account because I like to really um, look through the applications that come in before bringing them out to the other coaches and then you'll get contacted by one of the coaches we generally have a chat we'll send you out all the packages and details so obviously the goal of the shoot is that you're getting coaching into it with our team whether that be with Demi, Jess or Jason um, a lot of the coaching for this actually shoot in particular isn't going to be with me one on one and I want to be clear about that but I have put together all the packages because you should have had spawn the spawn of soon the spawn of sean yeah so we're Alice. doing january and the shoots in march so i'm definitely still going to be there and be present end of january and, um, well, yeah. yeah have some clients doing it yeah. but um yeah the other coaches are going to be helping with this project and i'm going to be really overseeing it so you're be, still very involved i'm still very involved right on the training programs all of that so it'll be really really cool and i think it's good for women that never want to get on stage or maybe don't have the right body type or right body shape for competing um, or the thought of a stage or even the financial cost. A photo shoot's way cheaper than getting on stage, that's for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Especially the deal that we got with these photographers. So we got an amazing package which includes your hair, makeup, um, shoot, photos, everything. So we get a really, really good deal on that as a group and then you do individual shots and a couple of group pics. Um, but yeah, so if you want any more details on that, 
send me an email. Be really cool. Um, we've even got a couple of pregnant clients that are going to be doing mm. it this time around. Um, I might even jump in there. <laughs> I don't know about postpartum. I've got like eight weeks, but we'll see how yeah. we go. <laughs> Maybe I'll do one with the baby. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it's all about, again, it's not – I have a few women already email me about it and say, am I the right candidate for you? And I was like, there isn't a right candidate. A candidate I, yeah. I don't care how you look as long as you are going to go through this journey – be proud of yourself at the end of it and get up there and rock it in front of a camera and have us help you and make you feel beautiful. That's what it's about. Hell yeah. Um, doesn't matter if you're 100 kilos, 70 kilos, 50 kilos. It's not about looking stage lean. It's just about being your best version of yourself mm. and having some really cool images that you might not have the opportunity to do in your life. Yeah, it's um, fun. It's fun. It's six scenes. It was funny. The girls did one last weekend and even like they would look on the camera at the photos being taken and go, Oh my god! Yeah. Is that what I look like? Fuck, I'm hot. <laughs> it's always like, the way in photo shoots, yeah, isn't it? You're you like, go, fuck yeah. yeah! I did yeah. not think that. And they're unedited. They're just looking at it from the yeah. back of the camera. Although I saw my pregnancy ones and was like, whoa, that's a bit different. <laughs> <laughs> but again, yeah, it's just a different experience. So anyway, we'll wrap that up from there. I'll stop spamming things. Enough um, plugging yourself. Exactly. Email is always the best form of contact. The one form of contact that I don't really enjoy is Instagram DMs. Um, Facebook about work stuff because things get lost yeah. and then you're kind of replying to someone you're doing something else whereas email set time I check it every day um, and then things get replied to so yep. yeah 100% just go via email perfect anything for you no as per usual uh, any constructive criticism or feedback they'll probably say do more regular podcasts. rate us yeah <laughs> Rate us on iTunes. I think we're pretty aware of the feedback. Yeah, we know that. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if there's any like other than that. Yeah, yeah. We're exactly. very open to feedback. We're not very like thin-skinned yeah, people. Yeah, like, oh, my feelings. I'm if, offended. And if you've got feedback on the podcast, it would be nice actually if you do send us an email or DM us about that sort of stuff. Probably not put that on iTunes because it would be nice if you... Because you'll offend me. If you could write more positive yeah. things on iTunes and give it a positive rating because yeah. all of that does affect how viewed the podcast gets. That's true. Um, but yeah, so that would be really, really nice, especially because it's a free resource. It'd be nice if you could take time out of your day to leave a kind comment and... Yes, please. That. And we will chat to you next time. Have a good day.